The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Addressing Barriers to the Ready Recognition and Timely Treatment of Pediatric Multiple Sclerosis. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash DKR860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome to this educational activity where Dr. Brenda L. Banwell from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania shares insights on the recognition and treatment of pediatric multiple sclerosis. My task tonight is to talk to you about addressing the barriers to the ready recognition and timely treatment of pediatric multiple sclerosis. Critical to this conversation is going to be to empower you um, and families to overcome both the diagnostic challenges and therapeutic access for care for children living with multiple sclerosis. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about what multiple sclerosis in children looks like, um, and we'll start with how it begins. So pediatric onset multiple sclerosis uh, is defined as the onset of disease prior to the age of 16 or 18 years, depending on what country you live in. And it represents about 2 to 5% of all MS patients worldwide. Onset prior to age 10, or pre-puberty, is exceedingly rare and represents about 0.1 to 0.7% of all individuals with multiple sclerosis. The age at onset and the relative representation of girls and boys changes with age. So for example, uh, when children are very young, prior to puberty, boys and girls are almost equally represented. At puberty and thereafter, however, girls increase in representation to about a three to one ratio to boys, uh, which is very similar to the much higher rate of MS in young women compared to young men. So how do children present? And this is critical for families to understand as well as clinicians, is that almost every child with multiple sclerosis will follow a relapsing remitting form of the disease at onset. What this means is they will have experiences of new neurological deficits. These relapses will then remit, uh, where they'll have a period of time where they're not experiencing new neurological deficits. This relapsing, remitting form of the disease uh, occurs in 98% of pediatric onset patients. In contrast, about 84% of adults will present with an initial relapsing, remitting disease course. Uh, the remainder of the adults presenting with progressive neurological deficits from onset which is called primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Primary progressive multiple sclerosis is not a disease that we have documented in children. Uh, and this is important because a lot of the literature about disability um, and impairment relates to the progressive stage of the disease or the progressive form of the disease in adults. That being said, the onset of multiple sclerosis in childhood is not benign. Children can experience cognitive impairment. They have a high relapse rate which means that on average, uh, children, if they were not being treated, would have two to three or even more relapses per year, which is higher than what we see in adults. When we look at the brain imaging of children with multiple sclerosis, they have a very inflammatory phase of the disease. What that means is we see lots of areas uh, where the immune system has reacted, uh, causing uh, what we call focal lesions or plaques uh, in the brain that are imaged on MRI as bright areas um, uh, on conventional imaging. Despite that, children do have a tendency to repair better. And when we look at the uh, MRI appearance of children with multiple sclerosis, we can see that those bright spots or lesions um, can repair uh, a little bit better, perhaps, than what we might see in adults with relapsing remitting disease. This may be part of the explanation for why, if you were to meet all of the pediatric MS patients that most of us care for, these young children and teenagers are not physically disabled. It is extremely uncommon for children uh, or teenagers to develop physical disability, permanent disability, while they are still children and teenagers. Uh, and studies that have looked at untreated pediatric MS patients from years past have shown that the rate of developing permanent disability occurs about 20 years from onset uh, in those children that at the time, of course, were not um, availed of the current therapies, and that this occurs at about a 10-year earlier time point than one would see in adults. So let's talk about what this is really like for an individual living with multiple sclerosis. So I'll tell you about one of the uh, children I look after. 
uh, a 15-year-old girl, previously completely healthy, whom I met when she came in with acute visual loss, reduced ability to perceive color, particularly shades of red, uh, and pain with movement in her right eye. She'd never had anything like this before. No one in her family has multiple sclerosis. None of them had ever even considered multiple sclerosis as something they needed to think about uh, in their family. She had had no prior medical illness. She was not on any medication. And her early development and school performance uh, were uh, quite good. In fact, she was an exceptional student in high school. We evaluated uh, some of the things we check uh, in individuals with multiple sclerosis. And as we see in many uh, individuals, if not all, uh, she showed evidence of having had a prior infection with Epstein-Barr virus. Her vitamin D level in the blood was low, uh, which are two of the risk factors identified in both children and adult MS populations. We did an important evaluation to make sure there was no infection. So we did a spinal tap and evaluated and made sure that her spinal fluid was clear of infection. But it was not clear uh, entirely because in the spinal fluid she had five oligoclonal bands which were not present in her serum. What this means is that she had present in her spinal fluid immune proteins that were being made by immune cells that live behind the blood-brain barrier or in the central nervous system itself, a finding that is present in over 95% of individuals with multiple sclerosis and is fundamental in our understanding, or at least in our diagnostic algorithm, is one of the clues that this is really multiple sclerosis. So we performed an MRI scan as expected, uh, we saw that the right optic nerve was uh, enlarged or swollen and enhanced with gadolinium, consistent with her clinical presentation of optic neuritis, which is one of the commonest first event uh, attacks in multiple sclerosis. What might not have been anticipated uh, initially was the number of T2 bright focal lesions we saw on the rest of her brain. She had lesions in the periventricular white matter, in the juxtacortical white matter, and in the brainstem meeting the distribution in space criteria for the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. At least two of those lesions were enhancing with gadolinium and the rest were not, also indicating the dissemination in time component of the McDonald criteria for multiple sclerosis. She also had something else that I think is very important and that is that when we looked on T1 weighted images where the spinal fluid is dark, she had areas of black holes which are small focal areas of permanent tissue injury that indicate uh, not only the damaging aspects of multiple sclerosis, but also tell us that even at this very first attack, there has been sufficient time to accrue these focal permanent areas of injury, reminding us that there was a phase of this disease hidden from her and her family that predated her presentation with optic neuritis. And so even though her first presentation would be termed a clinically isolated syndrome, in other words, the first event of demyelination, and we see these presentations in her case as optic neuritis, and other patients as partial transverse myelitis or a small focal lesion in the spinal cord where people present with symptoms referable to the spinal cord, such as weakness in the legs, sensory deficits, difficulty with bowel or bladder control, and sometimes with what's called their meat symptom, which is an electrical shock sensation when people flex their neck forward. I'll tell you that teenagers today actually refer to that as a cell phone going off in their back. Um, or symptoms in the brainstem, which can include nausea, vomiting, double vision, poor balance, or um, a gait instability. These clinically isolated syndromes, we now recognize and increasingly can confirm to be the first event of multiple sclerosis in many of our patients particularly and aided by the MRI appearance that confirms that this is not an isolated event. In fact, that there are many changes in the brain indicating that this is indeed disseminated uh, in space um, and in the case of enhancing and non-enhancing lesions in time. And she also had, of course, had the spinal fluid oligoclonal bands, which contribute as well to the confirmation that this is a chronic abnormal neuroimmune condition of the central nervous system. She therefore met the McDonald diagnostic criteria, which um, do specifically now include the ability to apply these criteria to children and teenagers. Uh, the 2017 version and the 2010 version that predated it both explicitly mention that these are age span criteria and apply to both children, teenagers, and adults 
with multiple sclerosis, with one very important caveat in pediatrics, which is that in young children, particularly those under age 12, one should always use caution uh, when looking for a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, in particular because of its rarity. Similarly, in children who present with a first demyelinating attack where they are confused or encephalopathic and have multiple neurological deficits all at once, meeting the criteria for something called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM. In that patient, one does not apply the McDonald 2017 criteria at that time point, and we need time to determine whether further attacks will really indicate in that young child that this is really multiple sclerosis. In both adults and children, multiple sclerosis is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to rule out other things. And the best way to approach that is to start by taking, of course, a comprehensive medical history, doing the neurological exam as we discussed in the imaging. We do several laboratory tests to look for other causes of white matter abnormality in the brain, the spinal tap as we discussed, to rule out infection and to look for oligoclonal bands. And depending on the clinical presentation, evoked potentials to look electrographically at whether or not there's slowing of conduction in the optic nerve, brainstem or spinal cord consistent with demyelination. The teenager that I was sharing with you, um, we confirmed right at the beginning that she had multiple sclerosis based on a very typical first event of optic neuritis. The MRI confirming distribution of lesions in space. MRI evidence of, of di dissemination in time based not only on enhancing and non-enhancing lesions, but also on positive spinal fluid findings. We immediately invoked our team approach, um, offering our social work support, our MS nursing care, um, and psychology. We offered formal neurocognitive testing, um, but as a straight-A student at that point in time, she didn't feel that was something she wanted to do, but it is an important part of early evaluation and certainly going to be an important part of ongoing care. We talked to the family about her MS diagnosis. Teenagers, many, are very private people. They're at that pivotal stage of normal development where they want to be their own independent self, but they also don't necessarily want to be distinctly different from everyone else as well. Therefore, having a new, serious, and life-changing diagnosis takes not only adjustment in the family and, the, and an adjustment for the individual recently diagnosed, but it has social implications. Um, and some of the teenagers that I speak with are simply not ready for everyone to know about it at the beginning. So one of the first things I talk about with a family is let's be sure it's clear within your family whose news this is, who is going to be shared with, and how this conversation is gonna move forward with people outside of parents and, and siblings so that the teenager or child has some autonomy uh, and some time to prepare for sharing this news when they're ready. We then, of course, start immediately talking about the options of therapy. Multiple sclerosis, relapsing remitting disease, is a treatable disease now. In adults, there are more than now 15 approved therapies in the United States. Challenging us in pediatrics, however, is that while all 15 approved therapies have been rigorously studied in the adult MS context, only one has been completely uh, uh, studied and FDA approved for pediatric onset multiple sclerosis, and that is fingolimid. Fingolimid is an oral therapy, as opposed to some of the earlier therapies that require frequent injections. So many of my patients are quite happy to hear that. Um, and the studies that I'll come back to in a moment uh, clearly showed that fingolimid uh, was very effective in reducing the frequency of relapses. So with my patient, we talked about her choices, uh, and she chose to start fingolimid. We performed the baseline eye exam and skin exam that are required before one dispenses this therapy. And um, as also is required, I carefully reviewed her vaccination status and made sure that she had had a full vaccine um, history, uh, and specifically and very importantly, that she was indeed vaccinated against varicella. So one of the things that uh, we strongly advocate for is the prompt recognition of pediatric onset multiple sclerosis and early access to effective therapy. Uh, pediatric onset multiple sclerosis is not only associated with uh, a high relapse rate and MRI evidence of prominent inflammation, it is also associated with early brain volume loss, the cognitive impairments occur early in the disease, and we would like very much to prevent progressive disease by early adulthood. Therefore, we want to treat our patients early. 
And this imperative is challenged by the relative lack of regulatory approval for most therapies. Particularly, there are at this point no therapies approved for patients less than 10 years of age. The data overall on tolerability of the available therapies is relatively sparse, and there has only been one informative completed clinical trial to date. One of the things that is very common in anyone with a chronic illness, but is particularly a challenge in teenagers, uh, is staying adherent to the therapy prescribed. I haven't yet met a child or teenager who enjoys injections. And so as a consequence, um, the injectable therapies have always had a higher rate of non-adherence um, and even sometimes a fear of self-injection, uh, particularly um, in patients that are under the age of 10. That may be improving as we have access now to an oral form of therapy and as infusion-based therapies become more available where the treatments are perhaps monthly or every six months um, and are perhaps easier to adhere to. But nonetheless, um, making sure that patients take the therapies that have been prescribed is pivotal to monitoring and treating them effectively. As we look back a little bit about treatment options and strategies that have been deployed for treating children with multiple sclerosis for the last 15 to 20 years, the traditional strategy was to start with first-line interferon beta or glutarimer acetate preparations. These have been shown uh, over years now to be safe and generally speaking well tolerated with the exception of the difficulty with injection. Many patients, as I mentioned, are not adherent uh, to these therapies in the long term. And so it was not uncommon in the past and certainly even more um, now that we would switch from these first line therapies to a more potent second line treatment uh, which could include medications such as natalizumab, uh, uh, B cell therapies such as rituximab, and now potentially in the future, ocrelizumab, fingolimid, um, and uh, there are two other oral therapies, teraflunamide and dimethylfumarate, that have not really yet um, uh, emerged uh, as being commonly uh, offered to pediatric patients at this point, and clinical trials in both of these agents are ongoing. So these new therapies that are a little bit more powerful and have different mechanisms of action, different methods of delivery, are previously the second line offered to most patients. And I think that is now changing. First of all, um, when one looks at what the uh, United States is doing in terms of the US network of pediatric centers, we've seen a real switch from 10 years ago, uh, where the first line injectable therapies were the commonplace first treatment, to now where oral therapies are emerging as the first line uh, treatment which is also in line with the FDA approval of fingolimid as a first-line therapy for pediatric multiple sclerosis. Infusion-based therapies are being uh, increasingly offered uh, and again offered earlier in the disease course, perhaps at least in part based on our recognition of the desire to have prompt, effective early therapies that lead to uh, very, very clear disease suppression. And you know, this is highlighted, I think, very clearly uh, by a variety of studies, uh, but one that uh, compared in a, in a retrospective manner um, how patients with pediatric onset multiple sclerosis were doing in terms of pre- and post-treatment relapse rate with the different therapies that were offered. Now, this is not a randomized trial, and there are limitations in how we analyze this type of information, but there was clear uh, reduction in the relapse rate after starting effective therapy compared to prior to therapy. There were a uh, reduction in the rate of new changes on MRI and less uh, evidence of enhancing lesion formation in patients offered the newer disease-modifying therapies in particular. So this provides some backdrop to the rationale for considering early and highly effective therapy in pediatrics. So let's talk about the one study that has been completed. The PARADIGMS trial provided level 1A evidence for superiority of fingolimid over its comparator, interferon beta 1A. The characteristics of the population were representative of what we see in pediatric onset multiple sclerosis. There were a higher uh, number of females, 62%. 63% uh, of the patients that went into this trial were treatment naive. The mean age was 15 years. The relapse rate was high at 2.4 relapses in the past two years on average, consistent with the high relapse rate in pediatric MS. The annual uh, relapse rate reduction of fingolimid compared to interferon was 
and 86% of the fingolimod treated patients were relapse free, which compared to only 39% of the interferon beta 1A exposed patients. There was a 53% reduction in the rate of new T2 lesion formation, uh, and the brain volume was more preserved in the fingolimod arm. So all of the primary and secondary endpoints favored fingolimod. There were side effects. Uh, notably, uh, there were a slightly higher rate of infections uh, in the fingolimod arm, uh, although flu-like symptoms uh, did occur in the interferon beta 1A treated uh, patients, a well-known side effect of that drug. Uh, there were no serious adverse events in the fingolimod arm that necessitated emergent therapy, but there were a small number of patients that experienced seizures in the fingolimod exposed arm, and this is an outcome that is going to be monitored in the phase four ongoing extension phase. So in summary, uh, the paradigm study confirmed that fingolimod significantly reduced relapse rate and brain atrophy compared to interferon beta 1A. It is an oral therapy which appeals uh, to not only my patient that I presented, but to children and teenagers in general. Uh, it is clearly efficacious uh, and showed superiority to one of the initial uh, platform therapies and led to FDA approval as the first therapy officially approved for pediatric onset multiple sclerosis patients. And I should mention that the study did not enroll children under the age of 10 years, uh, so the label does not um, provide uh, approval for fingolimod in very young pediatric MS patients. We need to monitor all of our patients uh, exposed to any therapy, uh, but I think we need to also consider the, the phase four or long-term outcomes of children treated with fingolimod in order to ensure that the safety aspects of this drug and any that come after uh, is indeed favorable in the long term. I explained all of this to my patient, um, and this was part of what made her decide that fingolimod was the appropriate treatment to start with, um, and we discussed all of the important issues that come with starting an oral therapy. Um, as is required when you start uh, fingolimod, uh, the patient requires monitoring to avoid any concern about first dose uh, bradycardia. And I reinforced to her that uh, that risk of bradycardia would reemerge if she were to be non-adherent for somewhere between seven and 14 days. And so if she forgot her medication or went on a trip without it uh, and came back, she would need to alert um, our team so that we could monitor her as she restarted therapy. My patient started treatment and um, uh, reported early uh, adherence. But things changed over the next six months. She started to develop more fatigue. She started to endorse uh, depressed mood, both symptoms she'd not had before. We worked on um, obtaining psychiatry support and counseling. And then we talked about strategies to try to reduce fatigue. So one of the most effective strategies to reduce fatigue is to pause and look at what someone does in the day. We looked at where she was spending her energy. For example, did she really need to do some of the same math problems 20 times over, or could a representative amount of homework indicate to her educators that she understood the material? We asked her not to carry a 40-pound backpack and to have a second copy of her textbooks or online materials that uh, you know, could be used to reduce the things she carried around with her all day. We increased her exercise because fitness is part of wellness and actually reduces fatigue, doesn't increase it. We talked about the pivotal importance of healthy weight. We looked at her diet and her overall uh, strategy for when she ate food and what foods she was choosing uh, and brought her down uh, from a, a sort of higher level body mass index into a healthier weight, which also improved her fatigue. It's important that when we think about treating our patients, not only do we think about fingolimod or medications or other treatments, we also look at the whole construct of mental health, emotional support, um, and of course, wellness, which is not the absence of illness, it's an active therapeutic strategy. And so for some patients, uh, we need to add therapeutic strategies to reduce fatigue. Amantadine, modafinil, fluoxetine, and methylphenidate have all been used in an adults with MS uh, to improve this pervasive fatigue that characterizes uh, many patients' experience of living with MS. We have used these therapies, particularly amantadine and modafinil in pediatric patients with good effect. So depression and anxiety um, are common symptoms affecting 30 to 50% of pediatric onset MS patients. 
I think consultation with a psychiatrist is a pivotal part of care. Uh, and the ability to recognize early symptoms of depression or pervasive anxiety is one of the things that a bond with your patient um, and a way to talk to them one-on-one -on -one enables. But I would also encourage people to think about the fact that the onset of multiple sclerosis in a child affects their parents. Many parents also experience depression and anxiety that, when treated, improves not only the parent's wellness, but also the emotional health of the entire family. Cognitive deficits are other symptoms that we need to think about. 30 to 50% of pediatric onset multiple sclerosis patients will have one or more deficits identified when tested using neurocognitive tools. For some of these children, these neurocognitive deficits impact academic performance. And very importantly, an individual education plan and a close relationship with the school can go a very long way to enabling a pediatric onset MS patient to improve function in the school setting. So as we think about managing multiple sclerosis in children, it is imperative that we think about uh, the whole holistic aspects of care. Uh, a wellness strategy is strongly recommended. We encourage vitamin D supplementation in order to achieve vitamin D levels of 40 to 60 nanogram per mil. We encourage regular uh, physical activity and remind families that physical activity will not bring on relapses and in fact will increase overall wellness and reduce disability in the future. We encourage our patients uh, to aim for a healthy body weight and to avoid obesity. And then we spend some time talking about smoking, marijuana, and alcohol. There have been several studies that indicate that smoking cigarettes increases the risk of disability in adults with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. And of course, there are no studies that suggest cigarette smoking is good for you. Uh, so we strongly encourage our pediatric patients to avoid cigarette smoke. With respect to marijuana, this is more controversial. There are many individuals living with multiple sclerosis that advocate for medical marijuana or uh, community-acquired marijuana as a means to alleviate some of their MS symptoms. There have been relatively few studies looking at marijuana uh, in MS and none to date in pediatric onset multiple sclerosis. So at this point, further work is needed to evaluate whether exposure to marijuana will compromise pediatric MS patients, particularly as it relates to cognitive impairment, or whether there are any health benefits to the use of medicinal marijuana across the age span. Finally, uh, a lot of teenagers uh, will ask about alcohol. Uh, we talk about the effects of alcohol as an impairing of uh, balance uh, and, of course, uh, perhaps in increasing the risk of falls and other complications that can come from being inebriated. So back to my patient. Um, she has continued on fingolimod and has been doing very well. Uh, we have monitored her white blood cell count and liver function and have not had to adjust dose. She has dropped her total lymphocyte count as one would expect as a mechanism of the therapy and has not had any increase uh, in infections. She did, however, have an increase in the frequency of her headaches, uh, which is also a common feature that was uh, reported by adults exposed to fingolimod, uh, and we needed to manage some of her headache care. She has not had any further attacks. Her MRI we re-performed at six months as a new baseline. So after six months of adherence to a new therapy, the six-month MRI scan serves as the new benchmark to evaluate the efficacy of her treatment. So we reevaluated her again at 12 months, and her MRI, despite the fact that she has had no new symptoms, shows three new T2 bright lesions. Gadolinium was declined by the family based on the increasing concern uh, amongst families about the potential uh, of gadolinium to remain within the central nervous system uh, and the potential toxicity that that might bring to bear in future years. Of course, we now recognize that the current gadolinium preparations are very much less likely to have this effect, but nonetheless, it's quite common now for families to question whether every MRI should be given with gadolinium. What do you do in this scenario? You have a patient who is taking a medication that she tolerates pretty well. Uh, she's adherent. She feels well. She has not had any attacks, but her MRI does show three new T2 lesions. What I did was look at the evidence, and when we look back at the fingolimod study, only 
of the patients on fingolimod, despite an 82% reduction in relapse rate, actually had no new lesions. This is a reminder that while the medication may be clinically highly effective, it doesn't suppress everything. Uh, and therefore, given how well she was doing at this early point, she, her family, and I elected to continue her on fingolimod, and we will perform further scans um, over the next coming years. All right, so the final takeaway messages. Multiple sclerosis does occur in children. Children with MS are at risk for cognitive impairment and academic challenges. As far as we can see, multiple sclerosis is a single disease across the age span, and pediatric MS patients are helping us understand the earliest aspects of MS biology. Therapeutic studies are now occurring uh, in pediatric MS cohorts. They're providing invaluable lessons on not only the efficacy of these new therapies, but also the feasibility of performing clinical trials in a population of MS patients that are supposed to be in school uh, and whose parents are meant to be at work. Uh, as well, of course, the imperative that we consider the long-term safety of the therapies we prescribe, both in terms of immediate issues and long-term. Finally, we have the overwhelming imperative to understand the impact of pediatric onset multiple sclerosis on young adults. How do our patients do as they grow up? So I hope that this session has been helpful to you. Um, and I hope that it improves your clinical practice and provides some feedback and ideas for how you might think about managing the children with multiple sclerosis under your care. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash DKR860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.